Okay, I think we're ready to move on to Lynn. Lynn manages green infrastructure, vegetation for the city of Chattanooga and the water quality program and volunteers for Tennessee Valley chapters of Wild Ones. She has a degree in biology from Warren Wilson College, experience with wildlife conservation, habitat and exotic invasive management and commercial fine gardening have led her to an ecologically conscious, conscientious management approach. She is an advocate for native plants, water resource protection, and other sustainable landscaping practices. Lynn, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I also work for the city of Chattanooga in the public works department and Pete and I and Anna, who's going to speak later about parks, really lucky we get to work together on a lot of different projects. This is one of my sites. This is a big bioretention basin. It's kind of like just a big rain garden. And this is at John A. Patton Rec Center. A lot of my sites are scattered around the city. Some of them are in parks. Some of them are at fire stations. It's just any public land where it's usually newer development where they try green infrastructure. The city is trying to be a good model and lead the way and put in these practices to reduce stormwater runoff whenever we build new projects. But the main point I want to get across that I feel like a lot of homeowners may not realize uh, and people doing gardening projects, you know, smaller scale gardening projects may think that their little piece of land does not have an impact on the whole watershed, but cumulatively residential areas have an enormous impact, especially urban and suburban areas have a lot of pavement and a lot of degraded soils. So stormwater runoff is a serious problem and it has a big impact on our, our waterways. Since I work in the water quality program, everything I do is through that lens of how is this protecting water? How is this keeping our freshwater habitat clean for wildlife? Uh, how is this protecting our drinking water in Chattanooga? We get all our drinking water from the Tennessee River. Let that sink in. <laughs> our drinking water comes from the Tennessee River. So whatever is washing down the street, out of your yard, into the creek, and then it's going to the river, that's where our drinking water comes from. My group also does a lot with flooding. So um, trying to reduce flooding in, in our city. And of course, also our economy and commerce depend a great deal on these waterways and tourism. I mean, uh, water uh, impacts our lives in huge ways, a lot of ways that I didn't think about until I got this job. So kind of the biggest takeaway I wanted to, the main point here is to show that in a healthy system, when it's raining, even when it's raining buckets, just raining hard, it, that rainwater is intercepted by some kind of vegetative cover. In Tennessee, traditionally, that would be forests or grasslands. Plants are intercepting that water, breaking the fall of the water, and then that water getting through down to the, you know, picture a, a forest floor with lots of leaf litter and really fluffy soils, like you can't even tell where the leaves in, uh, end and the soil begins. And that rainwater, for the most part, in a healthy system, soaks into the soil and there's very little runoff. In a city, however, where that soil is degraded, there's not a whole lot of vegetation, not enough urban street trees, right, like Pete's trying to protect, then you get a lot of runoff. In a healthy system, it's mostly infiltration down into the water table, but in an unhealthy system, that rainwater is runoff. And it's making our streams really flashy, floody. Right? So instead of soaking into the earth and then slowly feeding creeks and stream all summer, we get a just massive flood that causes a lot of erosion. Gares people, right? The roads fill up with water sometimes when our, when our infrastructure isn't working. So yeah, just think about this when you look at your own backyard or any land that you're helping manage. You know, how can we reduce runoff from that land by maybe reducing pavement or building our soils? or catching that water and using it for something? And also, how can we avoid adding any more pollutants to that system? So those are my big takeaways, and we'll see how far we can get 
with these slides. This is to show you that the storm drain here, storm drains are a separate system. They don't go to the wastewater treatment plant. They don't get treated. So if you've been throwing uh, trash or cigarette butts or leaves into the storm drains, I want you to know that that is going to the closest creek or stream in your neighborhood and it's not getting treated and cleaned up at the wastewater treatment plant. So your, your sewer system is going in a separate system of pipes to the wastewater treatment plant, but everything off the streets is going to the river and that's, that's a bummer. Here's our watersheds in Chattanooga. A watershed, I, I like to remind people that a watershed is, is land. So everything we do on that land impacts that water body. So here's the South Chickamauga Creek watershed. It's our biggest watershed. That has endangered freshwater animals uh, living in that creek. It's really badly impacted by development. It's in uh, pretty rough shape. Chattanooga Creek over here. We have an, uh, you know, a history of heavy industrial use in this city. Trying to clean up those waterways is important to this city and the changes it's gone through. And I wanna, I'd like to keep that, keep that up. So this is just more to illustrate how watersheds work. So everything we do in Chattanooga, right? That impacts the Tennessee River watershed. So that's the Tennessee River watershed, which impacts the Mississippi, right? So it's like nesting dolls. So your backyard is its own little watershed and then up and up and up. Uh, so we have global impacts with how we manage our own land. This is a, just a little diagram of a, of a rain garden. Um, I would love to, I'd like to share more with the master gardeners about how they can get reimbursed by the city for building rain gardens. And actually I see Carlton is here tonight um, and maybe he could tell y'all how that went at his house. So he participated in this program and, and we had a great time, we did a workshop, but the basics are that you're catching rainwater that is hitting your roof, right? Your roof is an impervious surface, so it can't soak into your, to your roof there, so it has to go somewhere. So you're generating stormwater runoff with your driveway and with your roof, so you can catch that water and uh, send it to a basin, so just a, a low place that can fill up so it has some capacity, some volume, capture there and then it uh, allows that water to soak into the earth slowly and get filtered by those plants. So the plants are actually a really hard working component of a rain garden. They're not just there to to look pretty and kind of cover it up. They hold that soil together. They may be um, breaking down different pollutants uh, or just catching heavy metals and holding on to them, keeping them from moving further through the system. Native plants, I, I pretty much only work with native plants and that's that's the norm in the stormwater industry. Almost all the specs that I work with uh, call for native plants because they are, they have deeper roots. They can help water infiltrate better with their root systems. Um, a diverse planting is more likely to have different. So you can depend on kind of taproody plants to really help with infiltration and break up compacted soils. You can count on these deep fibrous root systems to build that soil over time. And, you know, every winter the roots die back a little bit. And then um, in the spring they regrow and make new corridors into the soil, always fluffing it up over time. So it's just like a big sponge catching rainwater and sequestering carbon. This diagram doesn't show a whole lot of rhizomatous plants, but, you know, different mints, maybe uh, pycnanthemums or monardas, a lot of different, uh, or pacaras. Pacaras are great for kind of controlling that just top layer of soil for, for erosion. So yeah, I'm really um, pointing out the lawn grass here. Lawn grass, because we mow it so much and because it's mat forming plant, it does not have very deep roots. It's not great for controlling erosion on steep slope. It, um, it does not, usually soils under lawns are compacted from, from mowing, from the equipment and the foot traffic, and also just that lack of a root system. So a lot of times lawns are thought of as not being terribly pervious either. So some people compare them, call them call lawns green concrete. So we do advocate for reducing lawn. If you're interested in reducing your lawn and planting more gardens, gardens uh, or you know forested areas in your property, maybe a pocket prairie, those things all are better at intercepting that rainwater 
and getting it back into the earth and building soils. Quick pictures of erosion. So um, if you have bare ground, it's sediment is actually our our worst water pollutant in Chattanooga. And that may seem counterintuitive, but I'd love to get into details if we have time. Sediment just causes a whole host of issues in uh, freshwater systems. So please control loose soil if you have any on your property. Um, Y'all probably mulch, you maybe use cover crops or just more plants, right? We're all gardeners here. We're probably filling up every little corner of our yards with just more plants and plants are the best thing. Um, uh, mulch doesn't have roots, right? <laughs> so this would be a good time to call 311. If you see chocolate milk, sediment, um, water coming off of a construction site or, or for any reason, maybe it's not a construction site, maybe there's just something going on and you see sediment escaping into the waterway. This, this, um, this storm drain, again, like we learned earlier, that's going to a creek. Here's another way landscapers can, can watch out and try to do their part. It's gonna be really hard to get all this soil picked up after the project is over. Think about next time it rains, where's that soil gonna go? It's gonna wash into a storm drain. 311 will pick up your leaves, um, but in this case, you know, this person could have piled their leaves on the lawn they'd be less likely to wash into that storm drain while they're waiting to get picked up. And that's, that's also a problem because if that storm drain gets blocked, then we could have some flooding issues in that street and it becomes hazardous to, to drive there. Also, I just love leaves. Uh, <laughs> I just threw this in because leaves are great for mulching. Uh, I use leaves in my vegetable garden. I use leaves in my flower beds. I mow them. Uh, but also, you know, if you leave them, you're creating great pollinator habitat. Homeowners, there's been a lot of studies showing that homeowners are more likely to use uh, inappropriate levels of fertilizer and more herbicide than might be needed. And, you know, again, cumulatively, that, that can have a really big impact on our waterways. So this is, this is my parents' backyard. Very little grass in their lawn. It's a, it's a pretty diverse... <laughs> mix of weeds and uh they they love it it's uh, it's not all native for sure but it's it's a little bit better pollinator cover and again a, a diversity of plants means a diversity of root systems so they have really really fluffy soil in their backyard and they haven't used any chemicals or fertilizer um since they've lived there since the 70s and it it's gorgeous um so this is i see this a lot in chattanooga um conveyances or ditches. This this has been sprayed by herbicide, so I, I can't say why herbicide was used this way, but this is a really inappropriate way to use herbicide. Um, since there's no more plants here, uh, this erosion issue that they've got is just going to get worse. There's going to be more sediment washing into this system. The residue of that herbicide might be on that sediment. Uh, so that could be washing into a stream or probably just washing into this pond back here. The scouring that you're seeing here is just going to get worse over time. And sometimes people spray this because they think it's easier than getting off their mower and grabbing the weed whacker. Maybe it's a contracted crew and they're running out of time and it's just easier to do that a couple times a year. But again, those plants are not just there to look pretty, they're, they're a hardworking component of the landscape. Without those plants, we don't have that interception, we don't have that erosion control. So I think we've covered almost all of this. If you have a stream in your backyard, definitely protect your banks. Riparian buffers are really special wildlife habitat and uh, it's just, you know, protecting your own property, really. You, you'll keep losing those banks over time without protecting your buffer, getting some plants in there. So yeah, Rain Smart, please check out our program. We would love to, to help you build a rain garden or reimburse you for rain barrels. My Tennessee is another cool program. They'll come and check out your backyard and give you tips on how to be more water conscientious. So they've got some great ideas. The wild ones would love to teach you more about native plants, why they're better for wildlife and water, and sometimes easier to take care of, right? They're, they're not gonna need inputs um, like fertilizer. They're not gonna need irrigation once they're established. I haven't watered my gardens all year <laughs> in the drought and everything. Um, the Ecological Landscapers Alliance is a great 
resource. They're more up in the Northeast, but a ton of that information is very applicable, excellent organization. We were doing a volunteer program called the Rain Garden Guardians, where we did hands-on teaching through doing. We had volunteers working with us at four of our bioretention rain garden sites. We'll probably be picking that up again soon, and I think Anna is going to talk more about how you can get involved with the city. But uh, I would love to work with more gardeners, especially people that want to learn more native species. One of our sites has over 90 native plants growing there. So a lot of plant ID. That's a really tricky site, really fun, but definitely challenging to, to do that plant ID while you're working and learn a lot of plants at once. Anna, I think will show you how to get involved with, with volunteering. This is the Chattanooga website. And then the um, water quality program is on the website. So we've got some new information about native plants on there that is not pictured here. These are some really big PDFs, really great information here if you want to learn more about ecological landscaping or sustainable landscaping. So thinking about your, your landscaping practices and how you can benefit, reduce air pollution, reduce water pollution, create habitat, and just be more efficient. So these, these are great resources. That's my Tennessee that I talked about earlier wild ones. Uh, I have a certificate in native plants and that's been a really great program. Their newsletter is excellent once a month. Kind of keep, it's got a lot of different events, not just wild ones events. And uh, I've put in a plug for the Cullowee Native Plant Conference as the most fun plant conference I've ever been to. And that's all natives. Really, really great event. Uh, this is my email if anyone wants to get in touch. My, my, see, I phrased it. The Easter tornado storm killed many living trees and scattered debris everywhere. And I, I'm, I'm talking about on a, this is on like a 10 acre parcel. Um, what impact does this have on the watershed and what should a property owner do to minimize that impact? Um, I'm asking the trees are still standing and they're cut in two like a big lawnmower would scatter the debris. Is it better just to leave all that debris there? Or is it better? What's, what's the best course of action? Is that debris in a creek or it's just on the ground? It's, it's, on, it's on the ground, but it's near a creek. Um, it's, you know, it's in an area where there is, you know, drainage to a branch. Um, I talked with engineering down there about it uh, shortly after the storm, and they said it uh, it would be best just to leave it as it was and not, if we, you know, there's no real intention to develop the property at this time, uh -huh. just to leave it as natural as it can be, and it would have the best impact. And I, I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, um, yeah, if, if it's all just organic debris, if it's branches and leaves and logs, um, that stuff will just break down over time and, and turn into soil. And it may be helping in the meantime as, as kind of a loose mulch. But yeah, it, it, would, it would help most in combination with uh, some seeding efforts or some bank stabilization efforts, planting some new things to hold that soil together. Because like I was saying earlier, mulch Mulch can protect the soil from just splash erosion, but it's it's not going to hold it together as well as something with roots actually growing in the soil, like a thousand little little hands holding the soil together. Um, but yeah, that to to the to the larger question, those waterways are very badly impacted. There's a ton of pollution. I, I saw uh, we went out and cleaned up some of those streams right after the tornado and. It was just really heartbreaking. Just um, looked like somebody had sprayed one of those like spray foaming machines in this creek. There was just insulation all over the place. There was uh, kids' toys and just a lot of construction materials. We are going to be planting, replacing a lot of trees that were lost on city lands. And uh, we're hoping to create a residential uh, tree giveaway, and I don't have details on that yet, but um, Master Gardeners will definitely be informed if there is a tree giveaway to help with those those areas out there. 
Is there a city policy to have city workers and lawn care services carry off their lawn and yard waste? I've lived in cities where they have those laws, like you can't just blow it into the street. I have seen that so many times in Chattanooga where people just blow it into the gutters. Yeah, I really wish they wouldn't do that. Um, If you're seeing city employees do that, uh, then there's something I can do about that issue. But unfortunately, it's really one of those kind of impossible things to regulate um, to catch people, homeowners doing that, that just don't know any better. And as a citizen, you know, you can always try to talk to neighbors and you can talk to people you see and say that, you know, that goes to the creek, that extra debris will cause some issues in that freshwater system. I just... uh... My piggyback question on that was, do they have to, do they require any certification like the business is to be like water issues aware as far as drainage and soil or anything? Yeah, Um, that's such a great idea. I I have been um, advocating for a certification for a while. Uh, You know, in the Chesapeake Bay area, there's great certification that, that Anna used to work, work with a lot where that was just the that was just a hot thing to be in town was like, I am a certified Bayscape company and the work that I do is good for the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, I think that's kind of a big cultural shift that I would love to see here. And I, I don't know, do we change the demand or, or the supply, right? Do we, uh, I think probably we need to work on both. We need to get people asking for those service uh, and being informed about how they're managing their land and what they're asking their companies to do. And we also need to get to those companies and teach them best and make some kind of incentive. Yeah, you actually want to build a rain garden in a, in a dry place that has good drainage. It's, it's pretty different than, than, than building like a backyard wetland. A uh, rain garden typically has its amended soils with sand and you want a place that's already perking, already infiltrating pretty well. You don't want to add more water to a site that already has drainage problems. That's just a little misconception that that I find sometimes is that people okay. think, yeah, people think rain gardens are already wet. If you have an already wet spot, then you could just pick out some fun wetland plants and just have a little wetland garden. Downtown Chattanooga, the storm drains do go to the wastewater treatment plant That's only in the downtown area, though. So that combined sewer is what they call it downtown, where it's both. Uh, You don't want to put anything in those drains either, however, because during really big rain events, those drains overflow into the river with stormwater and raw sewage. That is is an unfortunate reality for, for most big cities. Some of these are great for riparian areas. Some of these are good rain garden plants. Some of them I highlighted the Asclepius and the passion flower there at the top because they are obligate hosts for monarch butterflies and gulf fritillary butterflies. So those are, passion flower is the only plant in the whole world that gulf fritillary butterfly caterpillars can eat. And it's the same with monarchs, they have to have something from the Asclepius genus to feed their their baby caterpillars. So without those plants, you don't have those butterflies. Uh, you could buy a lot of these from Reflection Writing. The Wild Ones just had a big plant sale last weekend, so I'm sorry you all missed that, uh, but I saw a lot of you there, I'm sure. Um, but Reflection Writing is our, our local, our only in-town nursery that sells natives. Uh, Be Thought Bicycle is a garden center. Um, but you can order native plants online through Ezel. They're they're kind of a, a middleman. If you if you can't buy in bulk from a nursery like North Creek Nursery or Hoffman Nursery, you can order through Ezel, even if you're not a professional landscaping operation. I believe it's I Z E L. And yeah, you can learn what watershed you're in. Well, I would like us to all. Um do the old zoom wave and thank all the peter and lynn and anna for for joining us and enlightening us and i hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship as the saying goes (laughs) and thanks a lot thanks for having us